Jesus. Um, I would say no doubt lived as a person, but to the extent of what he did, I'm not sure. If he comes walking into where I work, uh, shows me the signs of the, uh, the stigmata and tells me he's the son of uh, God, I might start believing. I don't, don't believe in God, first of all. Um, maybe because I grew up in like an age of science. I have a lot of different thoughts and theories on, on Jesus, and, and, but I, I don't think coming back from the dead is really, really possible. I just thought the idea of an all-powerful, all-loving creator of the universe was just an absurd idea on the surface of it. It wasn't even worth my time to check out. As far as Jesus was concerned, I thought that if he existed, and I wasn't sure whether or not he ever did, he was probably a, a nice guy, he was probably an excellent teacher, but he certainly wasn't the Messiah, and he certainly wasn't the Son of God. Now, my wife was more in spiritual neutral. She was more of an agnostic, whereas I was more antagonistic toward Christians. I just didn't know where all the pieces fit together. I didn't know who Jesus was or how he fit into the picture. Lee was antagonistic towards God. I was simply confused. There really was no room for God in my relationship with Leslie when we were dating and when we got married, but you know what? We were happy. We didn't have any problem with that. When I first started going to church, Lee responded very negatively. He basically told me that this is not what he had signed up for, that when we had gotten married, he had life planned in a way that did not involve church. My biggest fear with Leslie was that she was going to turn into some religious prude or something, and I thought nothing good can possibly come out of this. But even though I had all these negative ideas of things that were going to happen, in the ensuing months I began to see positive changes in her character and in her values and the way she related to me and the children. And it was winsome and it was attractive. And so when she invited me to go to church with her on January the 20th of 1980, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go get her out of this cult, you know, that she's gotten involved in. He did go in with his reporter's notebook so he could take notes and try to find the scandal. Well, the pastor gave a talk that day called Basic Christianity, and he just systematically laid out what it is that Christians believe. And I, I was, my mind was blown because I had all these misconceptions, and he really did straighten me out on a lot of things. And I remember walking out that day saying two things. First of all, I was still an atheist. He didn't convince me that day that God exists. But secondly, I realized, if this is true, this has huge implications for my life. Lee's approach was very different from mine. Mine was mostly a heart issue. I wanted to know that God was real, and the way that was real for me was experientially. And for Lee, it was more about documentation, about being able to have facts that proved it true. Well, I was a journalist, so there was really no problem with me picking up the phone and calling a scholar and saying, hey, I'm Lee Strobel, I'm with the Chicago Tribune. Uh, I'd like some background information about the New Testament. And so I, I would do that, and I thought it was gonna be so easy to expose the fallacious thinking behind Christianity. But as it turned out, it took me almost two years of my life to investigate these issues. It really was, in a sense, the most exciting story I'd ever pursued as a journalist. I think, unfortunately, because the documents, the New Testament and specifically, were written so far after Jesus' uh, death uh, that it's really hard to say. I don't know myself that it was real, I was not there, but people were there at that time. So the, their account of things that happened back uh, 
2,000 years ago has been passed down. As an attorney, I, I rely on evidence. And so, you know, it would be tough to get evidence at this late date. Well, I began my investigation by looking at the gospel accounts. How did I know that the New Testament was telling me the truth when it talked about Jesus? Now, obviously, I didn't accept the New Testament as being the inspired word of God. I certainly didn't accept it as being inerrant. But what I had to accept it as being, which it undeniably is, is a set of ancient historical documents. And I knew that historians had criteria that they could apply to determine whether or not these documents are trustworthy. So those are the kind of people who I pursued. I went after the heavy hitters. I went after the expert witnesses who could help me sort through these issues. J.P. Moreland, Biola University. Mark Strauss, Bethel Seminary. Craig Blomberg, Denver Seminary. Craig Evans, Acadia Divinity College. N.T. Wright, Bishop of Durham, United Kingdom. Over the last 250 years, it's been common coin in Western culture that, oh, you can't believe what's said in the Gospels. You know, it's even made into musicals. The things that you're liable to read in the Bible, they ain't necessarily so. And, and that's sort of, that skepticism has wormed its way into much modern culture and indeed into many Christian circles, many church circles, where they'll say, well, Matthew probably made this bit up or Luke just added this bit on the end of the parable or whatever it is. I and others have spent some of the best years of our lives researching what was actually going on in Palestine in the first third of the first century AD and trying to get inside the minds of first century Jews, first century Romans, different Jewish parties and movements, etc., etc. And the more that I have tried to do that, the more I've found that what you find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John comes up in three dimensions and says, my goodness, this actually belongs. It makes sense. It fits. It gives us very vivid portraits of who these people were and what they were doing. The New Testament Gospels are biographies of Jesus. While the authors do not identify themselves in the text, from very early in the Christian era, the Gospels have been attributed to Matthew, a disciple or follower of Jesus. Mark, a colleague of Peter, also a disciple. Luke, a historian and confidant of the Apostle Paul. And John, a disciple of Jesus. Both Matthew and John were among the twelve, Jesus' closest followers and constant companions throughout his ministry. They would have personally observed most of the events they described in their Gospels. Mark and Luke were also contemporaries of Jesus and wrote their biographies based upon information provided by many eyewitnesses. I knew from my years as a legal journalist the importance of eyewitness testimony. In fact, the first question that anybody asks is, how many eyeballs are there? How many eyewitnesses do you actually have? And I needed to determine whether or not contemporary scholars have ascertained whether or not the Gospels are rooted in eyewitness testimony. It's become evident to scholars of the first century that the Gospels were actually attempts to write biographies of Jesus. Now, not in the modern sense, because the Gospels are not particularly interested in his early years. But when it comes to Jesus' adult life and his activities, these are biographies. They're very clearly attempts by eyewitnesses to describe exactly what Jesus said and did. And the consensus of New Testament scholarship has moved in that direction. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Luke chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Luke's Gospel begins with a prologue. It's actually one of the finest Greek sections in the whole New Testament. Uh, Luke was clearly a literary artist. Uh, but in that prologue, he points out that he has carefully investigated um, the material that he presents in the Gospels, that he's checked with eyewitness accounts, those who are actually present. If you, if you read that prologue and you see this is the work of a historian, this was someone who has, has done his research. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. 
Luke chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. You have to understand that people in the first century valued eyewitness testimony. And this is why, from the second century on, it was important to the early church fathers that the people who were alleged to have written the Gospels actually wrote them and that they were eyewitnesses of the things they wrote. We have actually very early attestation of the authorship of the Gospels. The early church father Papias, for example, as recorded by the church historian Eusebius, identifies Mark's Gospel as essentially the eyewitness account of, of Peter. Well, Papias was a disciple of the Apostle John, so we are only one generation removed from Jesus himself. That's a pretty close testimony and strongly suggesting that, in fact, the Gospels are based on eyewitness accounts. Now, of course, it's not what you would have seen if you had a video camera there, because, after all, if you put a video camera on a street corner, even in Washington, you'd get politicians coming to and fro. You wouldn't actually have a story that would make sense. You'd have a string of random, unsorted events. That doesn't mean that none of it happened, that it's all made up. It's just to acknowledge what is blindingly obvious, that it has been edited and no doubt shaped by the needs of the community, because people tell the sort of stories that they want to tell, because this matters to us urgently here and now. Most historians date Jesus' birth between the years 7 and 4 BC and his death no later than AD 33. Jesus' public ministry began with the choosing of his disciples and lasted approximately three years culminating in the Passion Week and his trial and death. Scholars generally agree that the Gospel of Mark was written first sometime between the years 60 and 75 in the first century. Matthew and Luke were probably authored shortly after, followed by the Gospel of John. The New Testament Gospels are by far our earliest and most reliable records of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, all of the New Testament Gospels were written in the first century. Not only are they remarkably close to the events themselves, but in fact, eyewitnesses are still around. If they were passing on untruths, if they were not passing on reliable history, then we would expect um, eyewitnesses to say, wait a minute, this isn't what happened. Um, but eyewitnesses are around. Eyewitnesses could confirm what they said. All of the Gospel writers either were eyewitnesses or interviewed eyewitnesses to gain the information that they gained about Jesus Christ. As I scrutinized the gospel accounts even further, I realized that it was important to find out not just whether or not the information was rooted in direct and indirect eyewitness testimony, but I needed to know, was this information reliably preserved during the time period before it was finally written down? We have to put ourselves into the ancient world without modern media, without even a print-based culture in which the only and the standard way of preserving information was through oral tradition, most of which was memorized. Young rabbis were often forbidden to comment on a passage of scripture until they had memorized it perfectly. In fact, it was not uncommon for rabbis of Jesus' time to commit the entire Torah to memory. I've sometimes heard people say, look, I've been in a situation where I whisper something to someone, they whisper it to someone else, and it goes through 10 or 11 people, and by the time the last person tells what was said, it's totally different from what I told the first person. And we can't trust the Gospels for the same reason because it was transmitted over a long period of time. That illustration is really a bad analogy. And you have to understand that the first century apostles who passed on information about Jesus were deeply concerned to get this information correct because they saw it as sacred holy tradition. It wasn't about what Joe was eating for dinner last Wednesday night. In our day of instant media and everything has to be on film or tape recorded, we are more skeptical of oral tradition, but we don't really understand the nature of oral tradition. Oral tradition is a community event. A story is passed down by individuals within that community. Well, if they get it wrong, you've got an entire community that's going to correct them. So it is self-correcting all the way. These stories um, were passed on reliably because they were passed on by the community of disciples. In fact, we now have scholarly studies that have been done of oral cultures, and we know that through several generations, 
oral tradition can be preserved and passed on without changing a thing. Even though I became convinced that ancient cultures could pass along oral tradition reliably over time, I still had an obvious objection to the New Testament, and that was, isn't it really filled with contradictions? One of the issues people often raise is the question of apparent contradictions between the Synoptic Gospels, where there's a parallel story. For example, uh, Matthew tells the story of two blind men being healed, whereas in Mark's account, there's only one blind man. How can we get this contradiction? The vast majority of these apparent contradictions, however, are quite easily resolved. Uh, Mark describes only one of the two uh, blind men, the one who is most prominent, obviously, or perhaps even the one who became a disciple of Jesus and became prominent in the later church. So most of these apparent contradictions are, are quite easily resolved. Had every single account given us exactly the same detail, we might have accused them of some form of collusion, of having gotten together and carefully planned out how they were always going to tell the story with the exact number of details, but then one doesn't have independent testimony at all. It's natural when you have multiple eyewitnesses to the same event, you're gonna get different perspectives. And that's okay, you want that. What you're looking for is a core to the testimony that's the same, that's consistent, even though there may be some variation in the incidental details. If you're in a court of law and you have multiple witnesses come in and testify to the exact same thing, the first objection that's brought up is to say collusion. They got together, they orchestrated their testimony and their credibility is shot. The earliest known copies of the Gospels were written on sheets of papyrus and scrolls made of animal skins. They are among the oldest existing manuscripts of antiquity. The Codex Sinaiticus was authored between A.D. 330 and 350. It contains almost all of the New Testament and a significant portion of the Old, while the Codex Vaticanus from the same era is a nearly complete Greek copy of the entire Bible. A papyrus fragment from the 18th chapter of John dates to A.D. 125, less than a single generation after the Gospel was originally written. When I found out that we have no original survivors of the manuscripts of the New Testament, I became very skeptical. Because if all we have are copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, then how do we know that what we possess today bears any resemblance to what the original said? We have better manuscript attestation for the New Testament than any other ancient document. For example, the, the Bible of the Greeks, Homer's Iliad, is preserved in maybe 600 manuscripts, the oldest of them a thousand years after the document was actually written. The New Testament, we have something like 5,000 Greek manuscripts. So everyone agrees, whether liberal or conservative, that we have an incredibly reliable New Testament. We have thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament. We also have virtually the entire New Testament preserved in the quotations of the Church Fathers in the first four centuries. So that if we had no copies of the New Testament, we could reconstruct the New Testament from quotations from the early Church Fathers. Following the pattern of my investigation, my next step was to determine whether or not there was any evidence outside the New Testament that corroborates what the New Testament tells us. Jesus, of course, wasn't the emperor of the Roman Empire. He wasn't some autocrat that had conquered half of the world, but he did leave an impact in his own environment and created a movement that grew from there. And there is a remarkable amount of documents and corroboration. Josephus refers to him. The Roman historian Tacitus uh, refers to him, Suetonius, the